introducing Emily. Hey, Yay. I'm Emily. Um, welcome to my master's defense. My project is titled Open Range on the River, and it's a story about cows in a river and a lot of people fighting and suing each other over cows in the river. Um, but yeah, essentially I made a website with a long form feature story on it, and then there is an accompanying podcast series to go with it. So I'll be walking you guys through that today and talking a little bit about how I did the reporting and some of the challenges that came with that and some of the things I discovered while doing this. Um, so, okay, the mouse is very sensitive. Okay, so this is my main story. Um, so starting with it, when I've been interning for the Herald Review in Cochise County, um, for the last pretty much exactly a year now, I started last May, um, and one thing that kept coming up over and over again were these trespass cows in the river, and I was like, why is everyone so upset about cows in the river? Like, cows and nature, this whole area is ranch land, like, I didn't quite understand. Um, and then I was actually working on covering when Governor Ducey put all the shipping containers in the border wall. So through that, a lot of the organizers for the protests that went down to stop construction for that um, were also field researchers for places like um, the Center for Biological Diversity, and they were telling me that, you know, when you finish this story, can you please come talk to us about cows in the river? And I was like, okay, I'll talk to you about cows in the river when I finish this story. Um, and then I started talking to them, and the first interesting thing that happened was the main source I had who did not, or who really wanted to talk about cows in the river, suddenly did not want to talk about cows in the river because he was scared. He said that he'd been getting threatened in the field and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, this just got way more interesting. Um, and then I started talking to my editor. I was like, hey, like, can we just run this as a newspaper article? Very quickly realized it's not a newspaper article. It's a feature length story that really couldn't be gotten into in about a thousand words. Um, so through the whole shipping container process, I also finally got um, Governor Ducey's former press secretary to start answering my calls. And then he became the press secretary for Juan Siscomani when he got elected to Congress. So I was still working with him a little bit. And when Juan Siscomani set up his advisory council, one of the people I ended up contacting was John Ladd, who's the chairman of the Hereford and RCD. And he's a local rancher whose ranch is on the border between Arizona um, and Mexico. And he's been ranching in Cochise County for, I mean, he's a fourth generation rancher down there. So, but when I was starting to do the story, I was like, okay, like these ranchers are a very closed off group of people. They don't really like talking to journalists. They don't really like talking about what they do. They just kind of want to be left alone. But for some reason, he decided that he would talk to me about cows and invited me to um, Hereford Natural Resource Council or Natural Resource District Council's board meeting. And I was like, okay. He's like, well, these are all the guys who have allotments in Sprinka, so just come talk to them. I'll make them talk to you. So <laughs> that's how I got in and was able to actually not only talk to a lot of environmental groups who are fighting to get cows out of the river, but um, actually was able to talk to a lot of these ranchers who have allotments within the conservation area that are being challenged and just the local ranchers who were like, no, you've got to quit fighting us over cows in the river. Um, so the story is there are all these trespass cows in the river, but in reality, it goes back to, there's the San Pedro National Conservation Area is in Cochise County, Arizona. Um, and the San Pedro River is the last free flowing river in the Southwest. Um, and it's been designated, it has a conservation area around like 40 miles of it in Cochise County. And it's been designated as such because it's a globally important bird area. It's like this kind of bird watching paradise for a lot of people. It has one of the most like highest densities of biodiversity basically in the entirety of North America, um, that people don't understand that. They look at it and they're like, oh, that's like a dry river that's running through the desert half the year. Um, but it's become a critically important research site for a lot of people and cows keep getting into the river. So the story goes back to, let's start with the legal history of it. So, yeah, this mouse is really, really sensitive. Um, so yeah. So when Sprinkle was established, there was a mandate put in to conserve, protect, or conserve, enhance, and protect the natural area. Um, and that is what is being fought over today. The BLM is basically saying like, well, they never said we can't have cows in there. And all these environmental groups are kind of like, hold on, if you have a mandate to conserve, protect, and enhance the riparian area, 
and we have sent you thousands and thousands of pages of science saying that these cows are actually doing the exact opposite of that, you can't have them in here. So that's the whole thing with the lawsuits, is basically they're saying that. Um, but I started my reporting, and I actually went back, and I was able to talk with Dean Bibles, who was the state director for the BLM when this, um, when this preserve was created. Um, and basically, he was like, yeah, we never actually intended for cows to be in there. There was one grazing lease when we bought the land from a private real estate company, and we got rid of it, we retired it. Um, but then, for some reason, he was like, once I retired and left the BLM in 1989, they started renewing these leases, and no one really knows why. Uh, so, so yeah, basically, uh, okay, I'm gonna try this way, because my mouse does not like me. So it basically comes down to this. You have these two competing interpretations of the law. You have Robin Silver from the co-founder of Center for Biological Diversity, who's basically like, if you have this riparian area and your purpose is to promote, or sorry, to conserve, protect, and enhance it, you can't have cows in there. It doesn't work. And then you have John Ladd from the, chair, the chairman of the Hereford RCD, who's like, well, the law also says that it's to preserve, protect, and enhance the cultural values of the area, and that is ranching and agriculture. Um, so that is what they're arguing. He said, the way the law that formed the Sprinkler was established, it was an historical value of cattle and agriculture that was not going to be diminished when they formed the Sprinkler. So having cattle in the Sprinkler is part of the law, and none of the groups against cattle acknowledge that. So if the BLM takes cattle out, they're breaking the law. And the BLM has most recently, when they renewed their grazing authorizations this month on April 7th, they basically were just like, law doesn't say we can't. But legally speaking, that's a stronger argument, that if you have an area and you have a mandate to promote, conserve, and protect it, you can't have cows in there if you have all these thousands of pages of science basically proving that they don't actually belong there. Um, but when the spring was established, there were these four state trust grazing leases that got brought into the preserve after it was established in 1988. And basically, the meal had just traded with the state for some land because they were like, you know, it'd be really nice if this conservation area along the river was actually continuous. And it's a checkerboard of state, private, and federal land down there. So when they bought this big chunk of private land that covered most of the river, they didn't get all of the land around the river. So they were trying to bring in these state lands um, that would just make it a more continuous conservation area. The state lands have four grazing leases on them. And those four grazing leases are still active today. And that is why everyone is so upset. Um, so, basically, when the BLM got this area, they put out two resource management plans in 1989 and 1992 that said, you know, we understand that grazing is probably not conducive to this area, but we have these 10-year leases, so we're going to allow them to run out their terms for the rest of the 10 years, and then when they expire, we're going to just retire these leases. There won't be cows there anymore. That didn't happen, and no one actually knows why. Um, the BLM will not comment on the story. They won't answer any requests from me because they say there's active litigation and aside from those two resource management documents they put out in the late 80s and early 90s, they've never actually addressed the question. Cows just keep showing up in the river. Um, so, one thing that I ended up looking into was like, okay, the BLM is not going to talk to me, but a lot of these conservationists who are trying to get cows out of the river, um, are saying that, you know, we think it's local politics. We think that the BLM is capitulating to ranchers in a way that's not really appropriate. It's kind of playing favorites. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, so I looked into it, and there is a national history of, it's called the Sagebrush Rebellion. It started in 1976 when the Federal Land Management and Policy Act um, was passed. And basically, that act said that the public lands we have in the United States, which are like 12 million acres of land that BLM manages in the West, are no longer gonna be up for grabs. They're not gonna be up for grabs to homesteading like they have been throughout the rest of our history. And they're gonna be managed a little more strictly. So that was a lot of ranchers. Um, and you have people started protests in a movement called the Sage Rush Rebellion. And a few state legislators also got into it and were like, 
you know what we should do? We should try and get all these lands passed over to the state so that the state can give them out to people or manage them in a different way. That's never happened, but all this pressure from ranchers to be able to kind of use the lands however they want through protests and actually got a lot of steam. So I have a picture right here. So this was the cover of Time Magazine in 1995, the year before all four grazing leases were renewed kind of under, I guess, suspect conditions. Um, but this was part of the Sagebrush Rebellion. These ranchers in Nye County, Nevada had like bulldozed Forest Service Road while armed and were just like, no, this is ours, we're taking it back. So that was kind of the climate around public lands when these leases were renewed. So my story, I can't prove any of this for sure because you would have to go back in time and be able to speak with some of these people and get them to actually say this on record. But it does seem that there's evidence that um, all these, like, this kind of national movement to push back against the federal management of public lands was really what was pushing them to be like, you know what, okay, we'll still allow cows here even though everyone wants us to not. Everyone who made this area said that we weren't gonna do it, but we're doing it anyway. Um, so yeah, and then when Ronald Reagan got elected, he was like, you know what, I'm a rebel too, in one of his campaign speeches, and that's when the federal government actually really did turn, and you can see the reg uh, regulations and policies that they were actually taking a much more hands-off approach to how the public lands are managed. They were like, it's still ours, we're still managing it, but we're gonna be very hands-off, we're gonna just kind of let everyone do what they want. Um, and that was also kind of promoted by, we had a lot of lobbyists in DC who were saying, you know, just let the ranchers kind of do what they want, let them, they're the best caretakers of the land, they're on it every day, they see that land, they've grown up on that land, which that argument does have something to it. And that is what a lot of the ranchers who I spoke with told me, they're like, you know, we don't really get along with these environmental groups, but we do actually try to take good care of our land. So but that argument was pushed and that led to a reduced staff and reduced money for the BLM. So a lot of their management they want to implement, um, they can't because they don't actually have the people or the money to do it. So that's that. And then it's kind of walking you guys through this. So that takes us to the BLM. So the BLM won't talk to me about the story. And everyone I talk to, there's a lot of disagreements in the story. But the one thing that everyone kind of seems to agree on is like, ah, the BLM could really be doing a better job here. So the ranchers are like, you know what? Like, they gave us these allotments, and that's great. But you know, they promised to help us maintain fences. We have these federally owned fences on our land that are just falling apart and we're not really supposed to maintain them, but we're doing it anyway, because the BLM is just not getting out here to help us. And then the environmental groups are just kind of like, what are you doing? So, let me know here. I mean, and then this was Elizabeth Makings. Um, she is a researcher at ASU, and she said that, you know, she's been watching this process for a couple of or for a couple of years now, and it's basically just like when she wrote public comments to BLM, basically saying, "Please don't allow grazing in here." She pointed out how pathetic their management had been. Um, she was like, "You know, you said that you were going to come wash through allotments and make sure the land health evaluations were being done, and you've been out here twice in two years." This is the thing I kept hearing about. And going back to that original source who was kind of like, you know what, I'm scared I'm not gonna to talk to you, is this idea that there was this fear of rancher violence kept coming up over and over again. So in 2021, um, Scott Feldhausen, who's the district manager for the BLM down there, said in a public meeting when people were asking him, we have hundreds of cows in the river. As the federal agency in charge of this land, you know, you actually kind of have a duty to be rounding these cows up and even potentially impounding them, taking them away from their owners, if it keeps happening, why aren't you doing that? And he was like, you know, I've had previous bad experiences in another state where me and my staff were threatened by armed ranchers. I'm not gonna do that again. I'm gonna only be taking a good neighbor approach. So everyone I talked to, I could not talk to Feldhausen because he won't talk to anyone in the press right now, but I spoke with four different people who were at that meeting and got the meeting notes from the BLM and was just like, okay, what's going on here? The BLM notes from, or the meeting notes from the BLM weren't super detailed. They just kind of briefly said, like in one bullet point, Feldhausen cites rancher violence. And then I asked some people, and I was like, what was going on? And they kept bringing up the name Bundy. And I was like, okay, it's not Ted Bundy, the serial killer. It's Clive Bundy, the rancher, who 
real in reality for these people it might actually be worse than the serial killer. Um, but so they all said that they thought that Feldhausen was in Nevada um, when Clyde Bundy in 2014 decided to gather up a militia and go take his cows back from the BLM when he got in trouble for illegally grazing for over a decade. So he owed about a million dollars in grazing fees and was supposed to have his cows out of the land in like 1992. Mm -hmm. This happened in 2014. Um, but you can see here, there's some AP photos from this. I mean, it was a pretty scary event. So that happened and that seems to be what's driving a lot of Feldhausen's decisions, although we can't talk to him, that does seem to be what's going on here. So I started asking around and I, the person who kept telling me that it's rancher violence and this is the Bundys all over again, was Robin Silver, who's the co-founder of the Center for Biological Diversity. And Robin is, he's got a way with words that make him very unpopular, um, but and he's pretty to the point. He does not like the BLM. He's very direct about that, but he kept saying it was the Bundys, and I was like, okay, everyone else I'm talking to is kind of like, yeah, that does seem to be like driving Feldhausen decision making, but like, we just don't see it happening here. Like, we don't see these specific ranchers doing it. They don't have any theories about the Constitution like Bundy had that the federal government didn't own the land. Um, that just doesn't seem to be what's happening. And Cindy Toole, who's the director of Western Watersheds Project, one of the other groups suing them, was basically just like, you know, I've been working in other areas where there actually are credible threats. Guns have been pulled. There's FBI investigations. There's all sorts of stuff that's just not happening here. Um, but the Center for Biological Diversity were the ones who sued and forced the issue of removing Bundy's cattle in Nevada. So there might be a direct tie there where he's like, it's already happened once over a litigation, it could happen again. Um, so yeah, that is that. And then getting into it. Um, so there's all these cows in the river and everyone's kind of just like, where are they coming from? So. There's two different issues with cows. There's the four allotments that are in the Spranka that people don't actually want to be there. They're just like cow, like grazing should not be legal in this area. It's a conservation area. You guys said that you were gonna take grazing out when you established it. Like we need to get rid of these. And then there's the trespass cattle who are in the river who are not on the designated allotments. They've just kind of wandered off into the river because they're cows and they like water and it's a desert. So that's naturally where they usually go if they get off their ranches. Um, so the issue is kind of like, Everyone's pointing fingers going, the cows are your problem, the cows are your problem. So there's basically four places where the cows could potentially be coming from. Um, and the first one is that these allotment holders in the Sprinka get their, like, they're like, oh, it's all their cows. And they're kind of like, no, like the reality is like, they're not all their cows. Um, so this is Lance, Lance Clausen, one of the Sprinka allotment holders, and he was like, we don't want cows in the river either. Like, it's expensive for them to have to go find them if their cows get out into the river. It's dangerous to actually have to go down there and find the cows because the writing is really hard. It's not, it's not a good idea to have your cows in the river if you're a rancher is basically what they told me. So he was kind of like, you know, I had two cows get out and I took them both to auction after they got out because I was like, no, we're not doing this again. Like, I got you back once. I'm not going to go looking for you every couple of months. Um, but that is one theory. So he says, and then Jim Lindsay, who's a lot older next to him, they both have sprinkled allotments and they're both like, Every once in a while our cows do get out. We try our best to manage that. We try to be really diligent about counting our cattle, rounding them up, making sure that they're actually on our ranch and maintaining our fences and keeping gentle cattle so that they aren't actually trying to get out. They're like pretty content to just kind of stay with the herd, stay where the water is. Um, and they have water on their land so that the river is a cool source of water for them. But he was like, you know, it's not our problem. It's actually these ranches to the north and south of me, but I don't want to say any names. So the reality of this is the whole area is surrounded. If you come down here to this map, um, this is all the land around the Sprinka. The yellow right there is the BLM land. So the big strip is the Sprinka, and then you can see there's like little trailings off. And then there's a bunch of state land too. And that's all being leased out for grazing. So the entire thing is surrounded by grazing allotments and the BLM is not maintaining its fences. They keep getting told to, they keep being like, we have a contract out for it, we'll have them fixed in the next two years. So. Cows will keep, <laughs> keep going in the river. Um, so that's where you get all these trespass complaints. There's been 130 of them um, since the start of last year. So it keeps happening. And when the complaints come in, they're usually at least a couple of cattle, if not more. Um, so it is hundreds of cows in the river. And the big complaint there is that 
the science is not really supporting that. They're like, the science says that cows are actually pretty bad for it. And then the other point of contention I found in the story was because the whole thing is surrounded by allotments, they're kind of like, you know, if you take away our allotments, that's not going to keep cows out of the river. It's just going to hurt us economically, and we're being unfairly singled out when we're responsible ranchers. Um, and that is true. Like, if those four allotments were taken off, you probably would still see cows in the river unless really diligent fence maintenance suddenly became a thing with the BLM, um, which may happen if a court orders them to do so. But a lot of people are just like, you know, like cows are bad for this area. Cows are a non-native species. They're technically an invasive species to North America that came here with the first European settlers. Um, and so there's a lot of research out there that shows they're pretty bad for the environment. And the other thing is, there are a lot of endangered species in this area. So, like, it's one endangered garter snake. Um, and the cows, when they get to the river, it's even jaguar habitat potentially if they make their way this far north. Um, so yeah, when you have cows in the river, basically they eat all the stream side vegetation like grasses, they're holding out fat erosion, which causes more extreme flooding and sedimentation in the river. So your water quality goes down, your stream banks are lost, um, and you lose pretty much the entire understory, which then gets replaced with invasive species um, like buffalo grass and mesquite, things that aren't naturally supposed to be in there, and they're much denser. They choke out kind of all the other native plants that are supposed to be there, and they're much more fire prone. Um, so, back here. And that was a big thing was that this mesquite population was something that everyone was trying to keep under control. Whenever I visited the ranches, all the ranchers were like, let me show you where I've been able to control the mesquite and where it's totally taken over. Um, but the Center for Biological Diversity, two weeks ago, released a new survey showing how much of the spring that has been damaged by cattle activity. And you can see if it's red, it's severely damaged and it's over 90% of the river according to their survey. So, That. And then there's coli contamination because when you have cows pooping in a river, that tends to happen. Um, and it's actually in some areas, like the contamination is so high that it's hazardous to human health if it touches your skin. Um, but yeah, the ranchers I spoke with kept trying to be like, you know, like they were like, the science doesn't point towards cows being bad for the land, which makes sense. It's their livelihood. They don't want to admit that what they're doing is actually bad for the land. Um, and they kept bringing up fires. So they were like, you know, like, even though the cows maybe are like not natural here, they're actually preventing fire. And so there's a couple things around that. Um, I have a really good quote from Cindy Tool here, the director of Western Watersheds Project, and she's just saying, um, there's the saying that grazing prevents blazing. Yes, it's true. If you remove vegetation, it can burn. The same is true of paving. If you pave the spring bed, it wouldn't burn. If you mowed it, it wouldn't burn. But the land was designed to burn, and then the cows came in and removed the grass, and then there was nothing to burn. And then they left their poop behind with invasive species of grass seeds, and now it burns hotter and faster. So this area was designed to burn. Like, ecologically, it was supposed to have kind of like low, small forest fires somewhat regularly to keep the ecosystem in check. Now if it catches on fire, it's next to some major population centers in southern Arizona, and with invasive species like mesquite and buffalo grass that burn hotter and longer, the fires are much more intense. So that is also being debated. And then these ranchers kept telling me that they had people at the University of Arizona who were trying to support their argument that cows were good for the ecosystem. So I talked to Dr. Ethan Orr over here um, at the Cooperative Extension for the University of Arizona, who does a lot of work with ranchers to try and help them institute better management, better conservation tools, and he was kind of like, yeah, historically fire was good here. The cows have kind of helped perpetuate this, but now that the buffalo grass has gotten so out of control and just taken over these ecosystems, it actually might be beneficial to use grazing as a tool to combat that. Um, yeah, and then you can see there how it kind of alternates between these like dense mesquite areas and grasslands, um, and that's on John Lance Ranch on the border. So. And then part of the story was I got to go ahead and talk with some of these ranchers who really hadn't talked to anyone before. Um, I had read a lot of previous reporting on this where you 
know, it's just like kind of a small story on the BLM's latest management decision or the BLM getting sued, that kind of thing. But none of them ever had the rancher perspective in there. And I was like, okay, like these are the people who are gonna be impacted the most by this decision. Let's try to talk to them. Um, and the reality is like, when I spoke with them, they felt pretty defensive about all these lawsuits. They were like, you know, please don't take my land away. I need that. Uh, but they also were kind of like, you know, we don't want to just see this river destroyed. We care about it. We care about the land. We're here every day. So at the end of the day, if we could find a way to work together, and their way to work together would not be removing cows. So that seems to be the major sticking point there. Um, but they really do actually want to work together with people and try to figure out how like, the best way to move forward is that's not taking away their land, but also not destroying the ecosystem. Um, but going forward, there's also two more lawsuits that were filed yesterday. So... <laughs> That might not happen, we'll see. Um, and that was another element of the story was from the Center for Biological Diversity, Robin Silver. He's, his theory is that these ranchers want to use the river. They're purposely letting their cattle in there because it's free water, free vegetation. It's an easy way to get your cows back. He's like, they lie and they cheat and that's their plan. And the BLM is just turning a blind eye to it. The way he says that is pretty confrontational. So that has been a big thing in this with, you know, they're like, we want to take care of the land, but we really don't like these environmentalists. And then I started talking to John Loud a little bit about it, and he was kind of like, yeah, I met Robin Silver once. He came and demanded to be let on my ranch, and I wouldn't let him on. And he had some names to call him. But I think that does seem to be like one of the things here is that these two groups who are both trying to use the same area and really trying to protect the same area, they're at each other's throats over cows, and there's some characters in the story that are just like, no, like I'm not gonna listen to anyone. I'm not gonna do anything you say. I want cows gone. Or, well, I'm not gonna listen to you because your only thing you want is cows gone. And my whole livelihood depends on cows, so I can't talk to you. Yeah, that's that. Um, and then, I mean, this is one quote from Matt Ford, who's one of the leaseholders in the Baba Kamari. And um, he and his son-in-law just bought the ranch a year ago, so. They're really trying hard to make it work. Um, but he said, I just wonder when enough is gonna be enough for these people. You know, they don't care that they're ruining someone's livelihood. I'm not trying to say anything bad, but they got all the money in the world back, backing them. And two dummies like him and I go in debt ranching the first year and they're trying to jerk our leases out of here. So that's the sentiment there. Um, but to go with all this, there was a lot of information here. And as I was writing the feature story, Monica kept telling me like, you're too close to it. You gotta back off and like, figure out how to pare this information down and make it to where someone who hasn't invested months and months of their life in figuring this out can actually read it and digest it. Um, so I made a podcast and I'm just gonna go ahead and play you guys the opening to my prologue here. Welcome to Open Range on the River. In this podcast series, I'll be taking you along with me as I dig deep into the roots of the ongoing controversy over the cows in the San Pedro River. I'll be digging into the current history of grazing on the river, the current lawsuits over cows' continued presence on the river, and trying to take a look at both sides of this debate. are fighting so hard to get cows out of the river, and why the local ranching community feels so threatened by this. I'm your host, Emily Ellis. I'm a reporter for the Herald. So yeah, there's a nine episode podcast series that goes with this, and it kind of breaks down the story bit by bit. Um, but then I'm gonna also play you one nice thing with the podcast that I was able to do, something that couldn't go in a feature story without making it just way too long, way too detailed, uh, that people probably would not end up reading, was I was able to like really add in the voices of the people in this story and really go in depth on some of the issues um, that aren't being talked about in current journalism. And it also, yeah, it just really allowed me to explore it. And I mean, I think I have probably over 20 hours of recorded interviews that I had to pare down into a podcast, so it's still difficult. But I was able to kind of do some things like take you out on these ranches and stuff like that. Like, if we play the beginning of my episode on the ranchers, I was able to open up with just John Ladd driving through his ranch and talking about his cows and their behavior and kind of introducing me to them and like showing how much he cared about it. 
You know the. They all come up. When a calf's trying to suck his mother. Yeah. And, and she's done with it. The calf will get drunk, trying to hold her. Uh huh. So he goes back. So they're doing that thing. So that's what they're doing. So I was taking pictures while out there, uh, but that behavior he was describing is maybe, I don't know what's going on with his mouse. So yeah, there was the cows trying to actually hold his truck up while he drove through his ranch because they, they're trained to basically think that he has hay or other maybe like mineral supplements and stuff in the back of his truck for them. Mm -hmm. So when he see when they see that red truck coming, they all immediately surround it and try to get to it because they think that it's bringing them some sort of treat. Mm -hmm. And that's how he does. He's 75 years old now, so instead of getting on a horse to do roundup, he just drives his truck through his ranch and gets all the cows to follow it. <laughs> so yeah, that was I mean that was entertaining to see for sure when I was out there, um, but. Yeah, so that's that. I have my references here. So all of the sources I spoke with for this, um, and then some of the previous reporting I was referring to where these ranchers really weren't actually either not available for the press to contact or just not contacted at all. And one thing I found was that these environmental groups were so aggressive about talking to the press. They really wanted to get their side of the story out there. They really wanted to like show how the BLM was mismanaging this area and why this was so important. And the ranchers, I mean, John Lab told me the first day I met him, he was like, I don't usually talk to journalists because I don't like sharing my opinion just to see someone else have a different opinion. So they're pretty closed off and pretty defensive. So I think the fact that I was able to actually speak with them and get a better understanding of the story is something that hasn't been able to be done before with just the kind of shorter news stories that have been done where the BLM's made a decision or the BLM's gotten sued again and the environmental groups have a lot to say about it and they're the ones quoted. Um, so yeah. And then those were a couple of sites I used. Like, this is the BLM's e-planning site that has all of their public comments up on it and stuff like that. All the documents for the allotments and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and here are my acknowledgements. Um, I have to give a big thank you to Dr. Monica Chada for guiding me through this and teaching me to edit podcasts in just a few short weeks. She really helped make this project possible. Um, and then all of my sources who took the time to speak with me, sometimes invited me into their homes, and really, I mean, spent hours of their life talking to me about cows and trying to explain this to me. Um, I'm Professor Roddy McCour at ASU for composing original music for my podcast, and then all of my friends and family who helped get me back on my feet after surgery and finish the project. Yay! Do you guys have any questions about cows? About cows? Um, yeah, so I know you mentioned, like, the, obviously the VLM yeah. that I talked to you, which I think is pretty standard. Yeah, uh, for government yeah. 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 Um, so, but I mean, it seems like potentially a lot of this could simply be solved by them putting up their fences and taking care of them. Yeah, that's like, what pretty much everyone right? pointed out. Right. Um, so it's like a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. That was, um, I mean, so it's kind of like, well, I mean, it really doesn't matter what the ranchers are doing. It really doesn't matter what the environmentalists are doing. It's really about what the BLM is doing. Yeah. I mean, at least from my opinion. And their lack of management. And I right. mean, one of my sources, Cindy Tool, did point out she was like, in the last about six years, federal agencies, for a multitude of reasons between presidential administrations and COVID and stuff, have just lost a substantial amount of their staff. Mm -hmm. She was like, the BLM's procurement op like, office is understaffed right now. So, like, they don't even have the people to hire the people hired. Like, so there's issues like that going on, yeah. I'm sure. They're just kind of more bureaucratic. But yeah, you're right. That could really solve the problem. Well, and it seems like, uh, um, and I know you had mentioned this, and I know it's not technically part of your your project, because that would be a lot bigger. But I it just kind of popped to me, like, um, 
Is this also, well, I mean, obviously all of this land used to belong to indigenous people, mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering if, like, with all this uh, lawsuits going around, I'm like, is there, did you come across anything that was from maybe indigenous populations? So, that... Cochise County is really interesting. Um, it's one of the only counties in Arizona without a tribal presence right now. Mm -hmm. So there's the Cochise Stronghold and Chiricahua National Monument and stuff, which were originally like sacred sites for the Apaches, like big things, um, but the Apaches were all relocated to Florida forcibly and then to Oklahoma, they've never actually, they have one reservation in the northern part of the state, but they haven't made it back. So there isn't, that's something I've found with my other reporting in Cochise yeah. County is that just like tribal presence isn't there, which would be really great if they were and interesting if they still had a say in this, but yeah. Okay, um, I have two questions. One, going off the idea of the fencing, as a devil's advocate, could the BLM say that they're not, wouldn't put up fencing because it would, um, uh, what is it called, disturb migration patterns of some of the species down um, there, or do they just migrate through the river? They could potentially say that. A lot of the migratory species in this area are birds. Oh, okay. So it's okay. a major bird migration path. So um, it's not really like a lot of birds from like South America you'll find like at the very northern end of their range down there. Okay. Um, but they might say that I, after seeing some of the ways that the owner responded to their the um, protests of their most recent grazing renewals, like they were kind of just like, well, it didn't say we can't, so we're going to do it. Um, I could maybe see them saying something like that, but I think the reality is they're just going to be like, oh, we're working on it because the fencing is already there in some areas um gotcha. so and some of these ranches i know are kind of under the radar just maintaining the fence for the blm because they're like we don't want to deal with our cows getting in the river the blm's not going to do it they're just going to let us kind of do their job for them so we'll do it mm -hmm. okay and then my second question which doesn't have to do with that last question yeah. how which program did you edit your podcast through i use adobe edition okay cool yeah. Really random question. Yeah. Do cows actually like buffalo grass? Like, will they eat it? My understanding is they'll eat pretty much anything that's down there because okay. it's a desert and they are grazers. So I was just curious. Yeah, that they was were like their argument. Uh, yeah. yeah. I know they will eat pretty much any of the grasses. They'll also eat cottonwood, willow, saplings, and occasionally even go for the mesquites if there's like nothing else to eat. But Mesquites are pokey and not very good, is my understanding, but they do like mesquite pods, so they help spread them. So the other thing too about the water is, do you know if that water is utilized in any other way that like the cow, like for independent wells or anything like that, so that like the cow droppings have yes. more of like an EPA, like environmental. So, yeah, that so it's it. not, um, every, all water from Cochise County is pumped out of the ground. Um, there's a major military installation, Fort Huachuca, right next to the spring gut that's also being sued by the Center for Biological Diversity for their water use. Um, but they do pump a lot of water out of there. And that doesn't seem to be as concerning as the military. They seem to be doing pretty good like water processing and stuff like that if they're using it. But a lot of these local ranches or like smaller uses have dug wells that are probably pulling water from the river yeah. and are pretty old and probably not getting checked on. And that's actually been another issue I've come across in separate reporting from this where as the water levels and the aquifers drop, a lot of people are like having these wells that were safe to drink from for years and they're no longer safe to drink from because that aquifer is changing so, are changing so much. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a lot of like independent components that are like yeah, mm -hmm. that's so that's been together. making the podcast was so nice because I felt yeah. like through kind of like a narration of it and like being able to like put in interview clips and like really let them like tell the story how they thought it was helped kind of tie it all together versus trying to just get it all into a feature story. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you thinking about? I don't know what your plans are for after this, but. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, are you thinking of kind of, you said that like there was just as of yesterday or today more that, lawsuits. More lawsuits. Yeah. So are you thinking about like continuing this or following this I up? I think I'm going to follow up on this. Um, the cow complaints and the lawsuits will probably end up in my inbox no matter what. Yeah. So yeah, but I, I will follow this and I'm going to try and, um, I've been speaking with my editor at the Herald Review and we're going to try and publish this as like either a special edition or a series this summer. That's cool. I mean, because it would be really interesting to see if 
the lawsuits actually amount to anything. Yeah. Like any so that was one of the things. Changed. Like trying to like figure out how to conclude this. I was like, we're still almost in the middle of it, especially because mm -hmm. they've sued again. Mm -hmm. And the reason originally when they sued the BLM, they mm -hmm. settled and we're trying to just be like, hey, like, will you please take a look at cattle gra like grazing again? And like really take a look at the science and then get back to us in eight months. And that eight month period just came to an end. That's why the BLM reauthorized grazing a few weeks ago because they were just like, yeah, no, we're gonna do it anyway. Um, so now we're getting sued again. And, but one of the reasons they settled in the first place, uh, when I asked them, I was like, you know, like from a legal standpoint, this seems to be a pretty strong argument. Why not just take it all the way to the judge? And they were like, well, it's so time consuming to sue. Like it could take three, four years to get a judge to even like make a ruling on this. So, yeah. Very good. It's yes. really interesting. I yeah. never knew so much about cows and grazing. Right. Yeah. I no <laughs> idea that my life would be consumed by cows for like six months making this. But. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, like, how did you get on to this topic? I don't know if so, you mentioned it before, but. Yeah, I mean, when I was when I was working in Cochise County, like, a lot of people just kept bringing up cows in the river, and I was like, That's right. everything's so obsessed with cows, cows. in the river. <laughs> but um, I went to law school before this, and I focused a lot on, like, natural resource policy mm -hmm. and how these government agencies like the BLM are regulated and then how they regulate the land. Mm -hmm. So this, when it actually came down to just like the BLM's management and a lot of different laws that are kind of like super obscure, a lot of people don't know about, but are having a major impact here, I was like, oh, it's actually really interesting. And like, I could totally explain all this. <laughs> and is your focus mostly like environmental and kind of yeah. writing? Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Mostly just land use and water use. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's both of those things are super important in Arizona. Yeah. So awesome. awesome. Yay.